Thank you. I'm delighted to join you. And I think what you'll see as I go through my slides, which are a bit too much for the time that's allocated, so I'm going to be going through them quickly, but I've given full permission for them to be posted and shared. Um, I'm going to take a step back from focusing on how hospital activities are priced to talking about what's the cost of the healthcare system and how do we think more about a high performance system across a continuum of care, which is what the Commonwealth Fund, which is the group I work with in the United States, has been focused on for a number of years um, as we are trying to get our status of being the most expensive country in the world to at least if we're going to pay that much, we should have better outcomes. Um, but we'd also lower, like to lower the costs. For those of you who don't know the Commonwealth Fund, this is uh, one of these wealthy families in the United States that didn't have any children. So they gave all their money in around 1918 to do the common good. And they really had an affinity to the English-speaking world that was the old country and wanted to get to know the new country. So part of my theme will come, um, let me just see, do I click on the, which one am I clicking to go forward? Does, I, I didn't get instructions. How do I move the slides? The, the right clicker doesn't work and that one doesn't work. Which one? It moved, so it's, it's this one? Thank you. So the mechanical. Uh, what we are starting from way back when, when they started to say, how can the old country learn from the new country? We see ourselves as learning from all of you in a world where we can learn globally but act locally. Because every country, all the high income countries, are confronted with how do we meet the needs of our population as they age. New medical science is available to us. We're in a digital age where information is cheaper and we can have new tools, but how do we use them and blend them in and focus on the patient across a continuation of care? So what I'd like to take you through is some of the reforms that are going on in the United States um, and what we're trying to do there with a few other country examples with this focus on the whole patient journeys, not just the hospital pieces, but I have several examples of specific hospital interventions. We think it's a pretty exciting era because whenever we're in other countries or in pockets of the United States, people are saying business as usual is not the way we can proceed. We can see places where we could take waste out of the system, where we could get better outcomes, but part of that is we need to be paid differently because payment both enables or supports a different way of thinking about this whole system approach to healthcare. So it's not just a hospital day, but the total cost of that patient for a year, and could the outcome have been better? Uh, this is um, when I mentioned that we're the highest cost country in the world. We really are in our own little sphere. The black line is the United States. Um, I'm told that Australia is worried about getting about 10% of your national product or going to 11. We passed that in 1980. We're on our way to one out of five dollars. We're already at 18%. And the projection is over the next five to 10 years, we're going to be at 20%, one out of every five dollars in the United States. Going into a healthcare system where we look at our outcomes, we rarely lead. Every once in a while, we tie on a few. And we haven't been including the entire country. We, until recently, we had vast numbers of people who couldn't even afford to get in because they had no insurance. So I want to talk to you a bit about the reforms that are underway. Uh, many of you probably have seen the news headlines as Obamacare, as the Affordable Care Act, is um, discussed in the newspaper. It, all the focus has been on the insurance side, expanding coverage so people can get in. But there's been an equal focus on the cost of care and the outcomes of care. And these are just a few examples of recent US reports that say we're sicker than the rest of the world with poorer outcomes at every age level and at every income level. And reports we've done at the Commonwealth Fund, and I've seen you've done some of this in the um, Australian across states, we've said, how does our low income population compare to our high income population? And what are the geographic differences? And where can we see someone doing a better job as a care system, not just patient by patient, but as a care system? And can we learn by comparing? The Affordable Care Act that was passed in 2010 was a major insurance 
expansion, but there was another whole part of the law that changed the way we pay for care and started investing in information systems so people could compare how they're doing compared to others. And I'm gonna just take you through a few of these. We don't have any, um, we're just beginning to have early on evidence on whether this is making a difference or not. The law passed in 2010, pieces are being phased in, but the US system in terms of expenses for the first time ever in decades has had almost flat growth, no growth, for the elderly, not just inflation adjusted, but no growth for four years running. And it's our Medicare system, which is the program that funds the aged and disabled that's been driving the change. It's buying for the sickest people. It affects every hospital in the country. It, all the specialists rely on Medicare because of who the population is. And our private sector is trying to follow and partner. So part of what this law did was say, let's rethink our care system as a system and allow the federal government through its Medicare program to partner with our states or partner with a private entity. And we've put together something called an innovation center, which I'll mention a little bit later, which allows an effort to try something out in an, a geographic area with a group of practice. If it works, spread it. So not have to bring in one new system for everyone, but say what works. We're working at the Commonwealth Fund, but also nationally, we're increasingly thinking about the payment system and the way we pay, not just the way we price, but the way we pay, how bundled or not bundled it is, will enable us to think about what quality, what outcomes we're wanting to measure, and will allow the care systems to think differently about the patients. This is a three-dimensional, complicated picture when you think about it, but on one axis is what are those performance metrics? At a very low fee-for-service or DRG level, it's did the patient die in the hospital or not? It's a more process-oriented, did they get the certain protocols? As you get up to an integrated care system, you can say, how did all the patients cared for by this system do? Did they live a long life? Did they live a healthy life? So you can put new quality metrics on as you're more bundled in the way you think of paying, but you need to change the care system underneath it before people can say, let me think about patients across the spectrum of care. So a lot of what we have going on in the United States is primary care doctors thinking, I'm on the team with specialists, even if we're not in the same, between the same walls. Let's connect. Let's think of the hospital as part of our system of care, not just the place we admit a patient and wait till they're discharged back to us, which is quite a word when you think about it means ejected from some places as opposed to the transition to the next step. So we're changing the payment system and it makes certain things more feasible. Things are harder at certain payment levels and types of methods than others. This is all a quest for value. So we're both trying to slow the rate of growth, bring that curve down so we don't keep going up. If anything, we'd love to get to the next highest country, which is around 12% of their GDP and it would mean more than we spend on our entire education budget for the country, our defense budget, so it's a huge wedge. If we could come down, we'd love it. If we could hold it to GDP economic growth, we'd love it. But we're trying to change payment with a focus on value, enhancing primary care, but a 21st century new vision of what primary care could be, with not just a physician, but a team. Do care system innovation where the payment system spurs it, gives people an incentives and enables, and gives an information system that tells you how you're doing with a population health focus. And a lot of people in the US, some of our more advanced integrated systems are talking about continuous learning. When they try a series of steps, they learn something new and they can try to aim higher. So it is this aiming higher on performance. One of the researchers in the United States, a physician years ago, talked about a chronic care model. Um, where the delivery system is embedded in a community system where it has housing policies. Many of the patients go home and what happens in their care in the visit is less relevant than what happens when they get back with their family, but they need to be connected across the care system and we need to have a better information system. We're thinking of this as a model or a conceptual model and many people are working with this internationally as a way of organizing the care system around a patient thinking about what the care needs are, what the other resource needs are, and starting with how do we keep healthy people healthier, 
and avoid deterioration if you're chronically ill and take care of acute illness well. Um, in every country, we do surveys, um, and this is an example of surveys of sicker patients, people who have been recently hospitalized, had a surgical operation, have a lot of care. And every country has an issue of coordinated care. You know, you show up and your test results are there, they're redone again. The doctor, the first doctor doesn't know what the second doctor told you. The doctors don't communicate across again with silos. This is from a primary care perspective. What happens when you leave the hospital? When you leave the hospital, do you know who to call if you're in trouble? Do you know what you're supposed to do? Do you live with written instructions? Does anybody look at the medications you were on before you got to the hospital, any new ones you got in the hospital, and talk to you about where you need to change your medication regimen? All of those um, conversations, unless that connection happens, there's a risk of error, there's a risk of safety, and there's a risk of complication. So we've been particularly focused in the US on readmission rates because of the n number of people that are coming back where they didn't have a connection to the next place. So instead of calling it a discharge, we're starting to think of it as a transition. Our Affordable Care Act looks like a messy toolbox. Um, hopefully doctors' black bags look a little bit better organized than this. But it's put a lot of tools on the table saying to care systems, which are the tools that would be working best for you given what you understand your challenges are or opportunities. So in different, in a rural area, some tools might work better than an urban area. If it's a hospital seeing a very high proportion of low-income families where there's no one living with them at home and they're going home to a five-floor walk-up with no heat, it's a different set of problems than their daughters there the day of the discharge taking copious notes on what mom should do. Um, so really trying to think of what's the nature of the population we're served. And all of these were part of this act. There are different parts that are value-based purchasing, putting a, a penalty or a reward for doing a good job on it, putting a em new emphasis on population health, paying primary care in a different way, and I'm gonna try to give you a bird's eye view of all of this. In primary care, we've, been, we've had the benefit of holding international symposiums for a number of years, trying to understand what the Netherlands are doing, what the UK is doing, what is Australia doing with primary care that doesn't look like what we've done. We've had historically a very weak primary care system. But one of the things we've noticed is a shift away from narrow fee-for-service for primary care. Some of our doctors talk about it as toxic for them because they have to generate a visit to be in order to get paid. So there's a move toward a mixed mode of payment where part of the payment the doctor is getting, the practice is getting, not just the physician, is a per patient per month for an enrolled population and enables them to expand the staff to think differently about the resources they use. We have some care systems out on the West Coast that are thinking there's a whole bunch of people that just don't need to make visits because we can do virtual visits with them. We can do email consults but you need to get paid for that kind of staff time, so it's a different way of paying that allows physicians and practices to be much more creative. This is happening at our federal level, our state level, and our private sector level, and where it's working the best is where all those pieces are thinking the primary care practice is part of a larger system, so they're also changing the way they're paying the hospital and the specialist. So it doesn't work just to think about primary care, but this is a piece. We've also put in something called health homes. And here it is. These are patients that are chronically ill, have multiple comorbidities, have low income. In the US, we split our population by income. And they have a mental health problem. And they're saying, we, we probably need a different care team, a new cross-trained care team. And the federal government has stepped in. If someone proposes to them, we want to set up one of these teams, they'll pay differently. So this is one of those experiments and demos if we can recreate an integrated system where they don't necessarily all be employed by the same place, but they're going to work together because they all see that patient. I heard one group talk about this where they knew the psychiatrists who were dealing with some of their frail elderly and disabled were in separate offices than the primary care doctors and the cardiologists for these multiply sick people. So they decided to put them all in the same offices in the community. 
And a nurse said to them, they're all in the same office, but no one ever talks to each other. <laughs> Patient just goes for the visit over here. So then they started to do team meetings to discuss what are, you, what are you thinking about for this patient, that just by putting them physically in the same place, but, but trying to say there's a team here, and you don't even know that you're all on the same team. So this is, this is a little bit of a view of what Australia looks like when we talk to um, patients in our surveys, and almost everyone says, I've got a regular place I go, it's my GP, I have a practice, but if we say, are, do they really know you well, do they know your medical history, are they easy to get to, respond quickly, and do they help coordinate your care? We do this drop-off in every country to only about half of the people tell us that they have a primary care site, their gateway in, that is doing all of those processes for them. And I'm not going to show you the series of slides that goes with this. Those patients that say they have that relationship are more likely to not have coordination gaps. They're less likely to report medical errors. They're more likely to say they love their care. Um, so it, it brings with it a lot of other characteristics. And this is where the focus has been in the United States on that different way of paying to enable um, more integrated, more care management, and a new kind of care team approach, including a nurse who might follow that patient through multiple practices in and out of the nursing home. So they're not just based in that primary care set of walls. The other thing that's happening in these settings is with, I don't have my little iPhone um, in my hand, but digitalization has made information systems cheap, but getting connected, that people are using virtual consults with iPhones, with iPads, and talking back and forth. We talked to one practice where they had a community health worker who took her iPad home with the patient after the discharge and took a picture of every medicine in the medicine cabinet, and that's the way they did pharmaceutical reconciliation. She took a high level and they said, no, she shouldn't be on all of those, throw those medicines out, and the physicians could work with the patient. But it was an interesting use of a easy to use technology to get in the home. What we're seeing happen throughout the country, and these are just a few of the logos, is that the doctors in the hospitals or the doctors and the specials in different parts of the countries organize themselves differently. We've called these medical homes the primary care side. But every single little logo there, if you said, what does that look like? It looks a little different, because some of them are serving very low-income people. The Alaskan Native Medical Center is serving remote villages where you can only get there by dog sled or helicopter. You can, there are no roads, and there are only 200 people living there. So they've had to see, how do we connect what little we have in that community back to a hub? So each one of them has said, how do we make a more connected system? And all of them have focused on the sickest patients among them. And what we found is when there's that drill down on who are our hardest to take care of patients that account for most of the spending. And this is when I was listening to the hospital side, we're trying to say, what's the total spending for these patients all year? Counting the primary care, the specialized care, the nursing home care, the post-acute care, the hospice care. And what is the total spending? In the population after population, you find this relationship with the top 5% in any given year account for about half of all the money. The top 20%, 10% or 66% of the money. This even looks this way when we take just our elderly population. The healthiest don't use very much in any given year. And we've got care systems saying, how can we keep that healthy group from going up to the next tier level? And how can we bring down the cost of the most complicated patients? And all of our gains, both in outcomes and in costs, have been in that top, really complicated set of patients. And it helps to, for system thinking to be thinking about this. Mass General Hospital, which many of you may know, it's a Citadel hospital in the United States based in Boston, decided to see what they could do if they picked their 4,000 most difficult elderly patients. And they went through their past three or four years and said, these are our patients who are in and out of the hospital, in and out of the emergency room. They're our sickest. Our specialists see them. We've got some clinics that see them. And they said, we want to go at risk for that patient population. And they redesigned an internal pathway, portals that made it easier to get in, and said we're going to focus on them and understanding who they are. They added 
they call it's a nurse, but it's a navigator. They've, it, it's not like any nurse that you can think of. They cross-trained her, usually a her, to know mental health. And they said that she could do things with these difficult to take care of patients because they were very fragile in their homes and in their nursing homes that the doctors hadn't been able to do. And after a while, the physicians weren't sure this would work, but they all bought on and they started saying, you're only doing 4,000 patients. I have the 4,001 patient. I want my patient. And then they said, I'm sorry, we've only staffed up for 4,000, but they're now spreading it. And these are the kind of results they got. And this was not totally reorganizing thing, but really focusing on what's going wrong. They successfully um, increase patient satisfaction. The doctors like and the clinicians like to practice in this team. They, and this had a very robust information system behind it, and I'll talk about that in a second. They reduce hospitalizations by 20%, ED use by 25%. They save cost over a three-year period, so this wasn't waiting for decades. Um, they lowered their cost trends, and they lowered death rates. Um, it's a population that about 20% of them were expected to die each year, and they got the, the death rates down. They are now spreading it to other facilities within the partner system, and the next place has to relearn. There was a learning curve on this as they implemented it. Um, someone um, in yesterday's workshop had a wonderful scenario of the brain surgeon being very proud of him being a brain surgeon until the rocket scientist came in, and the rocket scientist was even more proud. But they said, redesigning care systems isn't easy because it's challenging old ways of working, and you've got to get willing people to come around. The other thing Mass General's doing, just when I think of your, your pricing system, is they are taking the information they can get from their payers and from the in internal systems and feeding it back to their physicians who never be saw, saw their own variations on how much do the radiologist practices vary, the surgical practices vary, and on any outlier, people are asked, can you tell me why? The first answer is always, my patients are different. But after they drill down and are their patients different, not necessarily. And um, one, one executive said, we quietly said, first we're going to do it anonymously, just array all our radiologists with outliers. Then we're going to do it with the names on it. And then we're going to say five or six years from now, some of those names won't be working with us anymore. But, but they were doing it as a let's just feedback, unless we can figure out there's a good clinical reason for you being this an outlier. So they started to look at where were their inefficiencies and waste. One of the things we don't do very well in the United States, and I'm not sure what the situation is across of Australia other than when we ask our patients, is thinking of 24-7 coverage for people, not necessarily in a hospital ED, but saying, is there something like primary care that's still in operation at 12 o'clock at night? Um, here we've got countries like the Netherlands, which co-locate an after-hour service staffed by their community GPs in the hospitals, but it's not a hospital ED. So it's that primary care patient that is sick at 2 in the morning, that's sick at 10 o'clock at night, not asking every physician to be on call. And they have these really cute little uh, vehicles where they do home visits. So it's, it's staffed by nurses, but the doctors rotate it through. They've lowered their ED use. It, it's a 24-7 coverage that happens in every area of the country. And it's something some of our care systems are saying, we need to think better about this. This is not, the ED, the emergency department, the a &E, is not the right place for a sore throat. We need to be able to have this be blended into a system and the Dutch system is helped, and our integrated systems are helped by shared medical records. So the patient's own physician knows exactly what happened at night when they show up the next morning, so they can share their records. The other innovation that's been going on is telling clusters of doctors and hospitals, not always with a hospital, if you would like to take accountability for all the people you serve, and they regularly come to see you. And you can say, I'm gonna be accountable for their outcomes, their quality of care, and their costs. We're willing to pay you differently. And this, again, is our Medicare program, which is our senior citizen disabled program. We'll pay you differently by saying, we think this is what your cost would be from our projection. If you can bring it down, so it's not necessarily go negative, but bring it down off a of projected, we'll allow you to keep part of the savings and you can reinvest it as you see fit. So if you wanna move care 
out into the home, move care into primary care. And this started in 2010. It was a law on the books. The first of them was funded in 2012. There are now 5 million beneficiaries enrolled, which is about 10% of the Medicare population. And our private sector has come in and said, we want to do that too. And what's been very interesting for us to see, um, if you read the press of the United States, you can see there's, a, um, there's some political fault lines in the US. And if you look at which states will go pro-Obamacare, against pro-Obamacare, um, does, doesn't want it. There are, we call them red states and blue states um, for the two political parties. This accountable care idea of being paid differently for taking full responsibility is everywhere in the country. So the doctors and the clinicians have said, we see an opportunity here if you would go into this agreement with us. And we've done transition funding if you can't take full risk, but you can take partial risk. We can do some advance payment. So we're waiting to see what this yields. It's just up and running, but the first 30 of them saved a lot of money, and eight of those 30 saved an enormous amount. And the stories are interesting, where hospital directors for the first time went out and visited a nursing home and walked through the nursing home and said, I'd like to see your facility, because a lot of your patients are being re-hospitalized. We send them to you and they come back again. And I've never gone and walked the halls of the place I'm sending them. So this connectedness, some have started to say, I want to have a home health agency that I really know that's also working with my post-acute, and we're going to be part of a team. And they're not all in the same walls. So one of the things that's been interesting is it does not seem to matter, ownership doesn't seem to matter. You can still be separate if you think of being working together. So all of this is going on at the same time when we're starting to pay differently. And you were, someone asked about performance metrics tied to payment. We did put in place some negative penalties for hospitals, for hospital-acquired um, conditions, infection rates, nosocomial infections, uh, catheter infections. We call them never events. We don't pay for never events anymore. One of the things every hospital did as quickly as they could is they got better at coding. Because if it was hospital acquired, they have to sh had to show the patient didn't have it when they came. <laughs> and they hadn't been coding that way. But we've seen a decline in that. And we've also put in place penalties for readmission rates. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Because our readmission rates, we've been on activity-based funding and DRGs, which have a big incentive to get people out fast. We have had very high national readmission rates with wide variability. And we think. That's a signal of either a problem at the hospital level, a problem at the primary care level, a problem at the post-acute level, but it's a problem somewhere. So it's a strong signal to dig deeper and work on it. So those are going on with some quality metrics. And all those ACOs I talked about, they only get their savings if they keep quality at least as good or improve. They don't get to share in the savings unless there's an improvement. So it's not just purely more money. This is what our reimbursement rate, reimbursement rate looks like across the country where we do local referral areas, and it's a twofold variation. This is the elderly, disabled population where in some places one out of five come back in 30 days, in others it's only 10%. The penalties just started this last year, but everyone was told in 2010, you're in the excess range. This is what happened to our readmission rates over this very short period. And I um, looked on my uh, news phone yesterday. We're now down to 17.5 at the end of 2013. This had not budged for about two decades, this, this national readmission rate. So the putting people on notice, showing them what their rates were. A lot of hospitals had no idea what their readmission rates were because they didn't always come back to their hospital. They went to another hospital. So it was coming back for any reason, not just for the reason you were originally ad admitted. And sometimes it's a drug-drug interaction. It's someone fell, but the person was coming back. So the rates have started to move. And what's been interesting is to watch them. Again, this seems to be happening, that people are starting to refocus. It's happening across the country, not in just a few pockets. It's the first time we've been able to think of a 300 million person population as having a national policy that's moving dots in multiple communities. This is all clinician-led. There wasn't any, what should you do? So this is people starting to say, what's happening? And what we found is often where the readmission rate is high, 
the initial, initial admission rate was high, that it was failing to prevent conditions from deteriorating in the community so that they're focusing on the before the person gets there and after they leave. Maryland is an example of one state that's doing a lot of work on all of these. So we have the ability for a state government to say we want to be different. The federal government has joined them in a five-year waiver. They put in quality incentives with penalties as well as rewards. They're in an activity-based hospital function, but they're expanding the definition of what's a hospital, and they're not going to get any increases. They'll get penalties if they don't lower hospital-acquired condition rates, don't lower preventable admission rates, and readmission rates. So they put three metrics on that'll be, you could be potentially assessed a penalty if you don't improve. So this is a system-wide issue, and what they talk about is they're trying to move away from an activity-based system that's very volume-focused to value-focused, that we want everything that's done to have a good return to it in terms of an outcome. And so they're trying to lower safety hazards, improve outcomes, and squeeze costs out because their hospital costs are very high in that state. And I'm gonna blitz through this next part to try to leave some time for back and forth. I think one of the things that's different in this century compared to a decade ago or 20 years ago is this digital age where tests can be digitalized, we can communicate with these fancy communication systems, electronic medical records, but communication devices, and it, it enables us to gather information and feed it back to clinicians, most of whom have never seen them compa themselves compared to anyone else. And wherever we've done this, we've seen improvement. It's not just the United States. The literature is excellent on this, that we, these are extremely competitive, talented, smart people that go into medicine. And if someone's getting a better result, they'll often ask why and want to go visit. Um, and it's the way we did heart improvements, brain surgery improvements, but it's now starting to be system-wide. And to just give you a couple examples of places that are thinking outside the box on what an electronic medical record could be, this is a children's hospital in Cincinnati that half of their children are poor, and they saw, decided to zip code map where their asthma admissions were coming from because they didn't think people had a genetic propensity to live in certain neighborhoods with certain kinds of asthma, but they observed that it was in these few communities where they got very high rates. They reorganized their team and their records, and they did brought their asthma rates so far down that they took asthma beds out of circulation. They were not getting admissions at all anymore. The hospital didn't build the beds. But they did that partly by taking their electronic medical record and saying, we're going to put all the clinical risks in, and then we're going to put social and economic risks in as a separate field. And when their high-risk patients come in, they get a different team, including they may get a call to the housing agency that we think there's a problem in the home environment. It's dusty. There's paint on the wall. They're now doing this with infant mortality, with special needs kids, but saying we can use that as a diagnostic tool to re-engineer the way we see those patients. But they never knew who their high-risk patients were and their full risk. Another example, this is a hospital in Dallas, Texas, said we know our emergency room users. We know our hospital users. They've been using us most of their lives. They have drug addicts. They have homeless. They have a very high-risk population. They did the same thing, and they put clinical and social economic risks in a record, but they did real-time resource allocation. The minute you're admitted to this hospital, they put up your risk profile, and they did this advanced risk protection. That one quartile of people on congestive heart failure, more than half of them were re being readmitted when they looked at it, and they allocate resources depending on what the person's risk is. So for someone with an unstable heart condition, they bring in a pharmacist and a cardiologist. For someone who has no home or no one at home, they bring in the home health aid. So they're pre-planning for when that person leads in the first 24 hours that the person's admitted and they lowered their readmission rates for congestive heart failure by a third in the first six months when they did this. They're now taking it, spreading it through the whole Dallas metropolitan area. All the hospitals are sharing these records, and the record is linking them back to what other resources are available in the community. Who do you call that's, if it's not medical? 
The last two are just some examples of things we're starting to hotspot and say, where else can we know something about risk? This is elderly people getting a drug that's on a don't prescribe list if you can avoid it. Um, we've got a two to fourfold variation in this. For the first time, we can feed this information back to our physicians that don't know what the patients are on because other doctors prescribe their drugs. We're not doing that yet, but the potential is there, and advanced systems are doing it. We're looking at ED use and all these systems that are trying to be more accountable, saying who are our, who, what is clogging our emergency department? Are they primary care patients that could have been seen if the primary care practice was open? Were they non-urgent? How do we rethink the way we've designed our after-hours care and our primary care? But were, they're using this data to say, where do we have a problem? Because we've got a two- or three-fold variation. It's not true in every part of the country that this is a problem. And the last, to leave just a few minutes left, is to think about insurance design. I know there's some carriers here, and I'd heard that there's some talk of putting co-payments in for GP visits and other things. We're learning, and the U.S. is a good example to study for what not to do. We have many experiments on what happens to low-income sick people when you pay, have them pay a lot of money or even a small amount of money. And the answer is they cut back on the care they use, and they don't do a good job of saying it's essential or non-essential. And Canada did a study on their elderly and low income to find the same thing just on drugs alone, that people were not taking the one drug you really wanted them to take, and they were showing up in the emergency room or the hospital. And so trying to think of a really value approach to an insurance design, that how do you align the incentives? If you want the physicians to do certain kinds of things, have the patients also want to do the same thing, that you really want to get this lined up. France is doing quite a bit of this. They're saying with her chronically ill, for certain chronic conditions, we'd love you to be in a care plan that you and your physician teams have agreed on. If you're in that care plan and adhere to it, we waive all cost sharing. So this is an incentive to join, and it's a reward to the physicians. They don't have to collect all the cost sharing. They also lower for all their low income. So we've got some country examples of saying, how can we be smart if you're going to put cost sharing in? We've got doctors starting to band together and say, where are we doing things we really shouldn't be doing? Because as far as we can see, it doesn't do any good. It's just wasteful. There's either no benefit, negative benefit, or a little benefit, but we do it routinely. And they're coming up with lists um, so they can talk to patients about choosing widely. And all of this is a system kind of thinking where there's a payment system, there's a delivery system, and there's an information system. And if they're working together, you can get pretty high yield, we think, going forward. We're not that different in the United States and Australia as I listen to some of the issues you're facing, except that we spend twice as much as you do, and everything's more expensive but on coordination. So I think we've got these opportunities to learn from each other and turn challenges into opportunity. But it's going to require the national level, your federal government, the state level, the private insurer levels to align the way they think about the care system and pull together. So we have an opportunity to really learn globally and act locally, but it is this notion of aligning the incentives. It's not one single tool that'll do it all, but a strategic way of focusing on the population. Thank you.